Right. Thanks for the intro, Theo. That was brilliant. Um, welcome, everyone. It's This is quite funny because I'm actually looking at a blank screen. So um, the topic tonight is getting your horse settled out and about. Um, we're about a week away from, from March. So I think hopefully the sun will start to show itself a little bit more regularly and consistently and we can um, we can all get out to our shows. But obviously there is that sort of those initial steps that could help to make that transition to going out and about and getting on with the, the, the season um, a little smoother. So I've got a um, slideshow that I'll share with you guys and we'll go through and we'll see how that goes. It's not question time yet. Um, let me, whoop, now let me just go out of there. We'll go back to the start. Okay, that's better. So I'm hoping everyone can see this. Um, that's just a quick intro to me. So the, I think what we'll talk about first is preparing for your first events. Now I've said events, but that could just as easily be your first trip out to see your friends or um, go and have a lesson or that sort of thing. And on that, I would say it's a great idea to do something like that before you go to an event where there's a high intensity environment. Just go to some simple things that you're familiar with and um, that your horse and, and yourself may have been before that you might know. You know, go through your, your, uh, your plan of what, what you're gonna do, what you need. Um, always allow time as well. So all those basics, I mean, I don't need to tell you guys about those, but it is really important to just think not just about your horse, but around the, the little bits that you need to do to get from A to B. You know, make sure the lorry's right, because when you come to handle your horse, if those little things aren't in order, obviously it adds a bit of stress, and that stress is really easily passed on to, um, to your horse, and that can sort of sometimes lead to some troubles along the way or a less smooth ride. So yeah, just I think just planning is a really good thing. Low intensity environments and those environments tend to be where, you know, places that you're familiar with. So preparation at home. So for me, in terms of once you've done all the things around your horse, then we look at things that we need to be able to do with our horse. And of course, when we're traveling, we've got to do um, our groundwork at home, which is get our horse loaded up. Um, I always find tying up a good thing to, to, to be working on as well, because you'll need to do that both ends. Um, and if your horse ties up and settles, or you can, you can get your horse to, to stay there and not worry about them pulling back, it makes going out so much easier. Um, you know, you can go and grab a coffee or you can duck and grab, grab your sheets or go and see a friend, whatever it may be. And obviously when you're handling your horse, the most important thing I think when you're anywhere around a horse is just managing your personal space. Um, if you manage your personal space and your horse respects you, then generally, even if they are a little bit um, excitable or looking around, they're, they're going to be respectful of you and therefore you'll feel safe and able to sort of start communication and, and control your horse till they settle and, and, and you, you can crack on. So there's that. Um, I've, I've actually done a few videos for you so you can sort of see some of these tips that I've used for your groundwork. Um, so obviously they're, they're quite simple but I find them really, really effective, both with excitable horses and with bargy horses. And I will say, which I'll probably well, actually, I'll put the videos on and we'll have a look at them. And then there'll be a couple little bits I'll probably add afterwards. So watch where you work. For those of you that have maybe come and seen me with Charlie, Charlie Armand, we did a meeting of the Minds tour last year and um, I covered some of these things in that demonstration, um, depending on which demonstration you went to. 
So this might be a bit of a refresh for those of you that have seen it, but um, it's, it's a good one. So watch where you walk. Uh, hopefully this comes across all right. I'll just let it play. So yesterday, Penny brought this horse out and she was a nightmare by all accounts. And the one thing I don't want her to do is get in front of me. So I think she was whirling around in front of Penny and jumping out and kicking out because she was so keen to get back to the field. Well, this might not work as well as we'd thought. <laughs> I'll give it a second longer and if it keeps buffering, well then Good. we'll... So I'm just using the technique of dropping the rope and getting her to just watch where she's walking a little bit and seeing if that's... A hmm. I don't know whether you're watching this there. I don't know whether we... Um... Do you want me to... Shall I just share screen and see if it works from my end? Um, if not, you... Because I've, yeah. I've got it here. Do you want to see? Because I'm on a full fibre super fast. Shall I just try sharing and see? Yeah, let me let me stop sharing and see if you can get it to work your own. We might have to do this with all the videos as all. But... Yeah, no worries at all. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, let's give it a go. Okay, let's but see. Bear with us, guys. Down. Technology. We did test this and, <laughs> and stopped. Yeah, it, wor it definitely worked <laughs> earlier. One... Space. Oh, so I think yours is yours still playing. I think that oh, doing sorry. this is letting go enough. Oh, where's that throw the... Right, let's see. Oh. Link doesn't want to work from... Maybe it's... Oh. No, it's not like oh, no. Okay, never no. mind. It's the, I don't know. Right about in front of her. Let me try one more time by doing this. And let's see. It may be that I don't have. No, maybe I've not got access to it. So apologies. It's not, not working from. Let, let me go back to this. Yeah, cool. And if, if the videos aren't working, guys, then we'll. Um, You'll just have to bear with an explanation. I mean, pick the rope up, of course. It doesn't have to be dragged. Yeah. Being on the ground. If I feel like she's being sort of respectful, I pick it up and walk along. All these things, it's best to give her a little reminder, get her head in the game before you come out. Got horses here to the side that might start to create a problem. But I want her thinking about this the moment she walks out of this um, or before she walks out of the yard so that she knows as she's walking along, there's that to contend with. If you get out and there's a problem and then you start doing this, you know, you might end up with the not really thinking and in a bit of a tangle. Good, you can see there. I just showed her the rope and she checked herself again. I could feel her switching sides. Now I might say to her, I want you to walk that side. But don't get too, she watch where you're walking. And she's got it around her leg and I can be a little bit, you listen. She goes. Let her go backwards till she steps out of that one. Okay. Okay, we'll stop that there for a second, I think. I think that's that's all pretty good. Um so I'll bring myself back up here and just just so I'll explain that, you will have seen something that you probably were taught never to do as a youngster, um, coming through the BHS or around horses. Um, I don't know what it is, but people are really scared of ropes and horses' legs and that sort of thing. It's something that I've done all my life. 
uh, with horses. And I'm very particular about how I do this, believe it or not. It looks quite casual and a bit blasé, but I use a, you know, a strong rope, quite a strong head collar. And the rope has got to be smooth with no knots in it. Um, and that means that it's not going to get caught on anything. It'll always slide past and around the legs, that sort of thing. Before I do this watch where you're walking exercise, I teach my horse by, you will have seen in the video where I bumped my horse's leg a couple of times. And that bump goes around the horse's leg and onto the horse's nose. And when you put pressure on your horse's nose, a horse should take that as a cue to go backwards. And, and so I, I teach my horse to sort of watch where they're walking. If they don't, they tread on the rope, they get cued to go backwards with pressure on the nose out of your personal space. That's the idea of it. But you do need to teach your horse in a controlled environment that if something does go around their leg, just step backwards and you can uh, take it out from behind, from around their legs and carry on. Once I've done that um, in a controlled environment and I can see that the horse is comfortable with that idea, then I use it in places like going down the track or when I'm out and about to get my horse's focus from out and around everywhere to back here with you on the rope, looking what they're doing. And once they're looking at what they're doing and watching where they're walking, then you can start to pick up and, you know, do some other groundwork with them. Um, as I say, this is a, a technique. It's not the technique. It's something you can have in your box of tricks. And uh, I find it really, really useful for, for doing it. Make sure if you're going to take this exercise out, you do practice it uh, at home first and your horse understands it as well as you. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's watching where you're walking as a, a slightly different technique, but I found it really effective. And I will say about that technique that um, it's, it's great because I see a lot of people sort of um, correcting their horses and flapping ropes and arms and all that sort of thing. And it's they're really not projecting themselves uh, correctly. And what it starts to do is irritate your horse or not get um, an effective response, i.e. a step away from you or out of your personal space. So they become more inclined to be excitable and almost I won't say aggressive, but challenging towards you because it's it's not clear communication. Whereas this, um, that technique I've found really useful, particularly for horses that are a bit um, aggressive towards people because you're not actually doing anything. The check comes from the rope and from what from one of their from their um, actions. So I find it uh, really good because of that. Okay. So we're gonna have a look at another, another video. We've got another couple of videos. This again, it may or may not work, but um, we'll talk through it as best we can if it doesn't. It's quite a quick one, this one. Come on, Lang. So I'm really exaggerating what I'm doing here. And I'm not doing it very fluidly, but the point I'll make in a second is key. Okay, so in that video, and I can, I can play it again while I talk um, because it's so short. In that video, I want you to really concentrate on my body, my body. I'm engaging my core. That's why I'm doing it in such a, an obvious way. I'm using my legs, see me crouch a little bit, engage my core, and I'm releasing when my horse takes a step. See my horse steps, I open my hand, and it's very clear communication. Now, not only does it need to be clear, but it also needs to be, um, your timing needs to be right on it. So when you see your horse move, uh, open your hand. And if you want to sort of project yourself, engage your core when you're doing this. Uh, it's, um, it's a really important part of horsemanship 
on the ground. Because if you're just using arms and flapping about, um, your horse is going to start flicking your head and start getting a little bit, as I say, irritated and potentially challenging. Um, so, so there, and that technique that I've just shown you is, is a good way to move your horse to the left and to the right. And I also put a little backwards in there. You will have seen that pressure on the nose there. And I held that pressure, got a step back and released. The amount of times I see people handling horses, they apply pressure on the horse's nose as well, really could have done with Woody. They apply pressure on the horse's nose. I'll just make that bigger. Apply pressure on the horse's nose. The horse doesn't move, so they start sort of tugging on it or, and then, or they stop and they go, come on. And all that does is sort of make your, your cue or your ask a sort of a, a really fuzzy ask. It's sort of on and off and it's sort of, it's not a consistent ask. You can tap a horse on the nose by just, but it's rhythmical. It's there, I need you to, when you step back, I release. Or you can have a constant pressure. And again, you maintain that constant pressure until they give you the step back. And patience is a virtue, particularly with constant pressure. If you hold, if you ask and nothing happens, some people want to add more pressure to it. Whereas in actual fact, with a constant pressure, you need to wait until your horse thinks about what they're being asked, responds, and then you release. And I've waited for a couple of minutes for some, for, for some of those sort of constant, using a constant cue before I get the step that I'm looking for. So um, be patient when you're using that and be consistent, make it every time. And then your horse will stop questioning you and become more willing as well. Okay, let's have a quick look at one more video, which I find really helpful for your groundwork in terms of preparing to go out. Um, hopefully we get this. This is with a young horse. Well, it, I think that says in the video, so I'll just play this. So this is Pinky, he's just off the boat from Holland. He arrived about midnight last night. So I'm gonna take him down to the round pen and let him stretch his legs for an hour or two. Uh, this is the first time I've handled Pinky, really. So the first lesson he's gonna get is leading. Now you'll notice me, I'm not hanging on to him too tightly and I'm keeping a bit of an eye on him. And what I can see so far is that he's looking around a lot and paying attention to a lot of other things apart from me. So before I let him go on the round pen, we're just gonna give him that little lesson, almost through necessity rather than want. So we're heading across the arena here. He's coming behind me. I've held onto him there just to see if you're steady, but you can see he's just trotted off. Now, a lot of people at that point will try to hang on to the horse. And all that's gonna do is give them something to fight against and pull. So I'm not gonna enter into that battle. What I'm going to do is keep moving around, keeping out of his way. But every time Pinky moves away from me, I'm going to give him a little bump and say, here I am, Pinky, turn and face me. While everybody's thinking about me, I won't bump him. But as soon as he's not, I'll just give him a little pull, as you can see. Come back to me, Pinky, here, pay attention. There he goes, he's stopped, at least. He's still not paying attention, but I'll give him the chance to follow me. He's decided not to. So turned him and faced, you're going to face me again. He's off again, looking everywhere else but at me. And every time he does, he bumps into the lead rope. He's got to work out what's easy and what's hard. There's the first big change. He's opted to turn towards and look at me without me even pulling the rope. There it is again, brilliant. Little rub, that's the first lesson that he's learned. Pay attention. Right, um, great. So you will have seen in that video how I didn't go for the constant pressure on a horse that is really out there and could potentially, if I had a held on to Pinky, he, he would have been a candidate to start rearing or something like that. So I took the option of controlling the energy that he had 
And you'll notice when I was doing that, again, I had to use my core. I had to anchor myself. And when he got too far away, it was a quite a sharp pull and release. So it was on and off. Now, a lot of people, when they're doing this, will they might say, I'm not strong enough. But if you engage your core and if you allow the horse to, to sort of move around you like that, their muscles are, are quite relaxed in, in terms of they're not bracing against someone who's holding a constant pull on them. Um, so when you do give a sudden pull around, it does have the effect of bending the body. And it is important for some horses that they do have a, a it's not a shock, but it's a real sort of, oi, pay attention. If you're a little bit too um, soft or, or wishy-washy with it, and you're sort of not really saying being black and white, then you'll find your horse starts to take a bit more of a hold of you and starts to get heavy and wants to, you know, and then you're in a bit more of a battle. So, <coughs> excuse me, being, being a little sharper sometimes will make your horse sit up and go, sorry, what do you want? And then again, you've got them in the room, you can start um, getting them to calm down and get on with your exercise or your, your event, whatever it is you're doing. All right. Um, so that's that. Oh, sorry, made a mistake there. I don't like the way that's make it, making a funny noise. There we are. Okay, good. So I hope those, those three exercises are really helpful and you would use those exercises or you could sort of visualize using those exercises when you're out and about just to get your horse um, to think about their personal space and to sort of start to pay attention. So another thing, you know, as I mentioned earlier in, in the webinar, uh, tying up. Now, for me, you can tie a horse up and, and leave them there um, and, and hope that they're going to stay there. Or you can teach them, you know, where they can move within that place they've been tied and that that is the best, best place to be. So for those of you that don't know, I don't know whether I mention it in this video, I'll, I'll, um, I'll just say now, is that I use resistance ties um, with a long rope, quite a thick rope. And that is the safest way, in my opinion, to tie a horse up. And once they've sort of learned to tie up, then I'll start to use this technique that you'll see in this video. This is a young two-year-old colt um, called Nathaniel. We're just going to move him from the left to the right to start with. So it's over and you'll notice I've got a long whip when I'm doing this exercise because I want to stay out of his kicking range so that's the first thing I'm looking for for Nathaniel to move over and realize that's what I want I'm going to walk this side I'm going to repeat that process and just make sure I can move him left and right Always have a little break once you've moved them, just to remind, just to let them know they've done the right thing. Over there. Good. Little break. And then we'll repeat. I'll do this a few times. And I'm just looking for him just to move without too much worry and fairly fluently. The reason you do this is to teach them their range of movement when they're tied up. So they know that that's where they can move to. Some horses will test the tie when you start doing this, they might pull back. Hence why I've got a, a resistance tie. So if they do pull back, they're, um, they're, they're gonna be safe doing that. And I can simply come back in, shorten the rope up but they're learning where they can move. And now once they know where they can move, it's time to teach them to stand in a particular spot. So for instance, if I want my horse to stay standing there, a check that I will do is simply to walk behind my horse 
and I would expect him to stand there. He hasn't stood there. So I'll simply move him back and wait. And I'll just keep repeating this process until he moves his back end over, pause, walk wide around him, and he's walked away again. So we'll, he's got to understand that when I ask him over, I will physically ask him over. But don't move if I'm moving passively. Everything about me, I'm not asking for anything. He's just thinking, oh, well, if he's going behind me, he wants me to move. So you can see he's a little bit picky about being told to move over. So that's why we've got to keep our distance. Walk around. Just pause there for a second. He doesn't look like he wants to move. He's seen me out of that eye and he hasn't moved. And that's the start of this process. I can come in and give him a little rub. So let's do one more. Over. Good. That was a great step. Relax and walk around again. Oh. Right, very good. So I hope you guys could see what I was what I was doing there. Um, first, teaching a movement and teaching the horse that they're okay in that area, and you know, and also to follow my my cues. Of course, horses are quite clever about following cues. You sort of move them left, you move them right, and while you're walking behind them, and then suddenly they're thinking, "All right, you've gone that side, so I'm going to move off, and I'm going to swing my backside around," which isn't very useful when you're trying to put a saddle on. However, if you follow that second stage of that tying up exercise and just get your horse to listen to your aids, don't just anticipate about where you're going, move when I ask you to move. And if I'm not asking, stand still. Now the beauty of this is horses can choose to stand still wherever on a tie, or you can ask them to stand where you would like them to stand. And they, they learn to be happy to be asked to go where you want while they're tied up. That means when you come in to saddle them up or handle them on the tie, um, you, can, you can get them to stand, settle and get, it, get your tack on or whatever it may be, put boots on um, before you go out and ride. If they do happen to decide, oh, I'm gonna swing into you or do something like that, which makes it really difficult, then you just step away, step out of that sort of danger area and just repeat the exercise. And very soon, they're gonna to learn to stand where they're asked and they're gonna hesitate. Oh, I wanna swing by, but every time I swing back, I get told to come back here. So I'm just gonna stay here. That's what we want our horse to get to, to that point. Uh, great. All right. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, preparation at home. So we're on to our ridden work now. Um, so with, with ridden work, make sure your horse is settled at home. And, you know, think about where you're going to your event or for your ride with your friends or whatever. What might you come across out there? Well, my suggestion would be to make sure that whatever you think you might come across, find a way to practice at home if you can. Obviously it's not possible for, for some people, but as much as you can, practice what you might be doing. And if you can sort of raise it to a point where it's even a little bit more than uh, what you might do out, when the horse goes away from home and you ask them, you know, you, you'll hear it often, I know, that um, say Charlotte Dujardin, she will have her horses operating at maybe a level or two above the level she competes at. And the reason is when the horse goes out and competes, they go, well, this is easy. 
you know, I'm, I'm all over this and I'm happy to do it. So that's, that's a good technique that a lot of people use, including professionals. So there's no reason why you can't use something like that, even if it is just to go to your friends for a hack or if you're going out to your first show, definitely a good idea. Um, you know, hopefully when you're bringing your horse back in, they might have a few, a few uh, fresh moments, shall we say. So make sure you understand how to control those moments and get those really settled before you think about taking your, taking your horse out. And if you have an excitable horse, make sure you have a technique to, to be able to bring them down. And um, I've said here that one of the things that horses do when they're being a bit spiky or, you know, or a bit unsettled because of the environment or whatever it may be, is that they make you sort of be, a, sort of come off your horse and say, well, I don't want to touch you. I don't want to upset you. Um, I would suggest that when you're at home, get your horse used to your contact, both with your hands and your legs. So they're not sort of going, oh, you're, you're touching me with the bridle or you're touching me with your legs. And that's adding fuel to the fire, which is the environment or whatever might be driving their behavior. So get them really used to that. And I do it simply by, if I get on and, I'm, and my horse wants to walk off, um, so I'm, uh, I'm just out of walk and they're not standing, I might, to ask my horse to stand, I might put a constant um, pressure on. So I might use um, my hands at say, I might have a, if, if as hard as I could pull is 100%, then I might be using 20 or 30% pressure on my, on my reins and likewise at the legs, if there's the hardest I can kick is 100%, um, then you'll be putting say, again, 20, 30% of leg pressure, but it's a holding leg pressure on. And then because it's a constant pressure, um, you need to try to wait or you do need to wait until your horse gives you the correct response, which is to just slow down and stop. And then you go from that 30% of pressure out to 5%. I wouldn't say take your legs straight off because when you take your legs off your horse and you make contact again, that feeling of you coming back on with your legs is again going to make them react if they're in a heightened state. So, so think about that in terms of bringing your horse down and getting them used to that contact. And I, I, I sort of liken it to giving your horse a hug to say, it's all right, stay with me. And uh, some horses, or particularly if they sort of start to accept this, it's like taking them out and holding their hand, you know, rather than taking them out and sort of, you know, you can imagine a kid, you take them out, you give them a shove, say, off you go, good luck. <laughs> you know, because you just say, go off and do something. They're like, oh, I don't know what to do. And they get a bit anxious. And horses are very much the same as that. So if you can be there to hold their hand, and that is a good way to do it, then I suggest um, practice that at home. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the, the, the key things that I will always use to, uh, to control any sort of behavior, if I haven't got a hug on them, um, or even if I have got a hug on them, I might use this circle um, as, a, in, as well as the hug, or if I, well, I definitely would. I would have leg on while I'm doing this one rein stop and, and turn. But I find this a really effective tool to control where your horse is going. So if you've got a hug on and you, Jason said, wait, and your horse is just walking off into the distance, well, yeah, that, that might not end so well. Um, but if you, if you do put a hug on and you're, you're wanting your horse to settle, just putting it in a circle means there's a compromise. They can move but they're just going around in the spot that you want them to, to find that, that break and relax. So let's have a look at a one rein turn. This is, this is probably a stage before in terms of controlling actual flight. So when your horse has a spook and jumps away, um, you, you, that happens very quickly and you want to be confident in yourself that you can control a spooky situation and direct them back to where um, they can settle and you stop any of that flight behavior running off. And if you pull in a straight line, 
you know, you can block your horse up and create rearing or something like that. So, whoops, sorry. Um, so yeah, just a couple of things to, to think about when you're riding. So here I am riding Milano, I think. Okay, and if I feel like there's one of these horses over here is going to, going to um, be a problem or he's going to react to it, then I might, have I got my turn to be able to practice? Can I bring him round? Yes, I can. See, you can do that, mate. Good. That might be something I need to do to control him if he suddenly decides, right, I've got to go. Instead of blocking that energy and just pulling on him, I redirect that energy and just say, calm, just control it and now move on. Okay. So really important little tools to have, you know, constantly watching their ears. Can I get that hacking frame? And sometimes when I'm riding along, if I feel like they're, they're, um, they're a little bit sort of worried and their attention is up and out and they're, they're gonna be reactive to something, then I'll ride with long arms. So if you just stop there, Pen. Long arms, so long arms and slightly shorter rein. So my contact is still guiding and still allowing the horse to travel forward. But if there's a problem, I've got this much elbow maneuverability to control my horse. So I can quite easily turn there just by bending my elbow. If I'm riding with short arms and longer reins, so I have the same contact, then when it comes to control a situation where my horse is in this sort of posture, up and looking and ready to react, then uh, I'm going to end up turning, but look where my hand's gone. I'm suddenly out, out of balance and I've got my hand in a very awkward sort of spot. So think about those, those rein positions, um, long arms, short reins, and when they're going really nicely and I'm starting to push onto the bridle, then I might start to bend my elbows and, and allow a little bit more rein for him to come into. Very good. Okay, so there's another little tip there for, um, for people that uh, might be sort of worried when you go out, what if my horse does this? If you practice this at home and have that in your locker, as it were, it will not only be a great thing to diffuse a situation, but or physically diff diffuse a situation. I find mentally, when you have these sort of tools, you're able to answer that, what if this happens? Well, I can just do that circle, or I can do, you know, you can answer those questions that go on in your head. And, um, and hopefully that will lead to confidence. Um, so yeah, I've already spoken about getting them to, to accept your leg, but there's just a little note there to say about holding, their hand, holding your hand. Okay, and there's, there, is a, there is another thing. So these are exercises that, that you can practice at home. Um, and before we get on to this exercise in the arena, it is important to have a, a plan. So if you're out hacking or you're going on a ride, you know, and you're sort of thinking, oh my gosh, there's, I've got this happening or that happening. Um, right, I'm gonna, my plan is to stay focused on what's in front of me and just ride my horse to that point. If you feel like your horse is wanting to duck left or right and doesn't really want to go forward, I find uh, an incredibly powerful thing to be able to do is to stay focused and keep riding towards a point in front of you. If you can do that mentally, then physically it projects yourself in the right fashion towards your horse and your horse will pick up on that and will be much, much more likely to keep traveling forward. Um, if you get caught into the trap of thinking, my horse doesn't want to go there, I, I wonder where my horse might end up, and you start looking over your shoulder or tightening up, trying to stop your horse from moving, then that can lead to 
you know, some some more more difficult situations to have to correct. Um, so yeah, focus. And again, or something else might happen. You've got your circles. If your horse goes to shoot forward and you want to control speed, then come around here, control the speed, get your hug on, and relax. See that that that's going to be a new phrase for you um, for you guys going to horse step. Get get your hug on. <laughs> Uh, you heard it here first. Um, okay, so if you go into an arena, then it's, and if, you know, most of the time we want our horse to go and just be settled. So I've just put a really basic pattern here for you to, for you to look at. Now you can choose, there's all sorts of patterns you can use. I've chosen this one, but the point of the pattern is what I really want you to focus on. Um, and that is in this pattern, you'll see it's, if you listen to me say it, you'll start to see what I mean. You go in and you go right, 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 right. And you can see where I'm going with that. So it's quite a monotonous pattern. If your horse is a little bit um, busy, circles are always good because it sort of creates a little bit of bend and you can always make the circles smaller or bigger depending on how your horse feels. But generally, if you've sort of, if you're riding and you're trying to look for rhythm, then do something that's slightly monotonous and your horse goes, oh, I know what we're doing. We're just doing that thing. So I'm going to settle into a rhythm. Again, practice at home till you feel your horse go, okay, tick tock, tick tock. And they find, find that. The thing about doing lots of different things, um, it, it can work in terms of getting your horse to focus. Um, and, and it depends what stage your horse is at. So if your horse is working at a slightly higher level, then yes, um, adding in some other movements to get your horse to really think about what they're doing um, is a good idea. However, if your horse is, 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 not at, is not at a high level, they've just come back into work, then Changing things up too much actually gets your horse's mind a little bit busy and can add to that sort of um, anxiety. I won't say anxiety, but to that sort of desire to want to move when what you really want to do is get them to just settle. Um, so this, this pattern could be good. Again, all horses are different. So you might need to adjust patterns depending on the level you're at, the situation you're in, but it is, a good idea to have a plan when you uh, when you go to an arena or anywhere for that matter. Uh, good. Oh, are we there already? Wow. Um, I'm sure there was some other stuff that I was going to talk about. But there. Well, I, I'm sure there'll be other tips that come out in the Q and A. Um, that's fantastic. Yeah. Some really amazing tips there. And one or two of those I recognised from your meeting of the minds tour with with Charlie as well, when Heidi and I came to watch you at Reese Heath. So it's really good to see those, um, those tips in action there. So we, so folks, while you get typing, remember you can type any question, doesn't matter, big, small, um, ask questions that will really help you with your horses. We've got one question already, type them into the Q and A box and we will ask them and we'll get even more tips tonight from Jason. So we'll start with Emma's. And Emma says, one of my two-year-olds will simply and calmly keep pulling the resistance tie through right to the end of the rope. What would you suggest? For the moment, I've switched to tying her to a Velcro quick release. So, so you've got to remember these resistance ties are training aids. And like with all training aids, you have to... Um, or riding or anything that you're teaching your horse, you need to progress. So you're exact, that's exactly what horses do. When you put it on, uh, on the weaker setting, which is just through over the neck and back through again, you'll find there's not a lot of resistance on the rope, which is good when your horse is a little bit worried about it and they sort of pull back. They don't wanna to feel too much resistance. They definitely have to feel some, but they don't wanna to feel too much in case it panics them. However, after a while, they'll pull back or they'll feel it and they'll, they'll come forward again, shorten the rope up. So you need to be around when you're training your horse to tie up. You can't just sort of leave them and hope they're gonna be there when you get back. 
um, you, you will need to sort of make adjustments with this bit of equipment. Uh, but as they start to get used to it and you think, oh, okay, they're not panicking so much anymore and they're sort of, no, they're just testing it, but they're not actually panicking. I increase the resistance. So there's different ways to wrap the rope in and around through that resistance tie, which add more resistance to it. So as they get more comfortable, I add more and more resistance till they're basically tied pretty solid. If they'd have to pull pretty hard to, to get it out. And you're just increasing that level of pressure that they can cope with. Oh, that feels solid, but that's okay. I don't need to panic. I'm just gonna come forward. And so that's, that's how you use those ties. That's a really good question because uh, it does happen. And you, you, you know, as you have just found out, you're not always told these things. And uh, it's a really important part of using these ties. Yeah, absolutely. And um, just a <coughs> question on the technical aspects, because do you need a particular rope and a particular halter? Because you, you have, um, you're looking around to see if there's one handy. I do, I do have one just over here. Will you bear with me and I'll grab one? Certainly, yeah. You might not have uh, Woody tonight, but you have another prop. Oh. <laughs> Brilliant. Keep keep typing in the Q&A uh, box, guys, and I will ask the questions for you. While Jason picks up his magic rope. Ah. Okay. So, you know, I've got a... I've got a, there's my tie aid, which I would clip on to something. And the, the usual way, or I'll just show you how I do it. I would fold my rope in half. How can I make this most, so fold in half like that, push through the bottom end, like so, and then bring it over the neck. So I don't know whether, can you see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's so good. That, that's what yeah. that, and that will have, so I can, um, it's quite hard, but I can pull that through fairly, you know, I'm not even having to use my core to do that, but that's where, that's where I initially start my training. So the horse, you know, takes the panic out of it. And I've got a quite a, a long rope as well. So they can pull back a good, good three, four meters before and they need that to be able to go oh, oh i'm okay and then you can go in shorten the rope up they'll do that three or four times and then they'll realize well there's no point it's it's quite hard work to pull that rope out so i'm not going to bother with that unless you get one of those horses um that are a little bit sort of clever and they start to go oh, oh god I got a little bit I got a little bit more i got a little bit more and away they go so when you start getting, if you, if you spot that, then you can increase the resistance by simply having it in that, that state, but taking the end of the rope and maybe wrapping it around a rail. And just the wrap around the rail adds another level of resistance. If you wanna really increase the resistance and remember to always test the resistance so I always get a hold of the rope and I give it a bit of a pull. I make sure it can move a little bit if, if my horse is um, starting to advance through the, the stages of tying up. I always want to be able to just move it a little bit because they're much stronger than me. If I can move it a little bit with a lot of effort, then they will be able to pull it out, but it will be quite difficult and they'll sort of give up on that pretty quickly. Um, you can thread this one now back through the middle and then over the neck. So it looks like that. So it's gone through the bottom, back round through the, and then back over. And that, I can't sit here and pull that. A horse could pull it a little bit, but yeah. I couldn't. And that adds a lot more resistance. So if you tie a horse like that, they will, they will get sick of pulling against that. Um, but yeah. Best to not let your horse realize they can do that though, I always find. <laughs> they, then they just go, I'll see if I can. Yeah, they get curious. Um, we've got a few questions coming in now. I will just do Heather's first, because it's in relation to, to the whole, um, this kind of halter system. At what age can you start using 
she said halters. I think she's referring to these these tie tie up pieces and the halters. I have a ten month old and a normal head collar. Yeah, oh, she means the halter that you use. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I I do use rope head collars. You're right. I mean, you can certainly use any head collars you want, um, and it's not so bad actually with these with these. Um, tie the resistance ties because they never pull and hit something solid and it's going to break something because it gives so the pressure isn't as much so you, you know but you want to have a good quality head collar you, you know if you're working with folds and that sort of thing a fold slip if you're going to tie up with a fold with, with a not with a fold slip but a fold head collar then make sure it's not one of those flimsy little ones that you know with sort of old leather that's going to break because once your horse learns pull back and they can get away from it, um, then, you know, you, you've started a little problem there. So I would say good quality, normal head collar will be fine. Um, hook it up to the, to the tie aid, test the resistance to, to where you think your horse is at. The better your horse is at tying up, the, the more resistance you need to start using. Um, and, and I will say, if you've got young horses, they need to be taught to lead a little bit before you tie them up. They need to understand pole pressure. Okay. So you, you sort of, you have to give them that idea so that they've got an answer to, to, if they do pull back and they're not sure, they go, oh, I'm gonna, this is not working. So I wonder what happens if I do, if I follow the same, what I did when I was being led mm. and come forward. So they've yeah. got a bit of a, they've got an answer. They've just got to find it. Yeah, okay, be helpful, thank you. Um, Sam Wright has asked, oh, it's just said, I've come to this a little late, can I watch the rest of it later? Yes, Sam, if you're still watching, and in fact, to all of you, you will get tomorrow, probably in the afternoon, you'll get an email with the link to this video and you can watch it again and again. So if there's anything you want to just refresh yourself on, uh, perhaps you tried something, you wanna go back and watch it, you'll be able to watch again and again. So yes, that, Sam. Um, Susie says, hi Jason, can you give me some thoughts on how to cope with a horse becoming very stressed and upset by a loud tannoy in the dressage arena, please? So again, I reckon if you've, if you've sort of thought about your prep, I mean, I have a, um, a, tannoy, a tannoy here. If I'm taking horses out, I just play some music through it, but not too loud. You know, if you've, the thing that really shocks a horse is, you know, everything's quiet, people are milling around. What competitor number 362, could you please enter the arena? You know, it's just booms out across the, the, you know, the place and you're just underneath, the, it's that shocking sound. But I would say, um, get a, you know, a little uh, speaker somewhere and just play some music for a little bit. And if you've got it on your, iPhone or something like that, you can stop it and play it again. You know, it is that sort of preparation for these events. So when they get there, it might be a bit of a shock, but they go, well, I've heard, I've heard something like this before. So I, and I don't need to, to be sort of all anxious and worried about it. So, and again, it is always best if you've prepped your horse for the big occasion, then gone to the big occasion had the event and your horse has got anxiety and then tried to correct it. Mm. So prevention is better than cure. Yeah. In terms of it takes is much quicker preventing the problem than it is to try and cure it. Right. Um, thank you for that. Thanks from for Susie. So Rachel says, hi, how about settling a horse that gets all cross behind another as his pace is that gets all cross behind another as his paces are shorter. So even with a longer rein and pushing him forward, he gets shorter and more bottled, trying to canter on the spot and sideways. The horse is also more concerned who's coming up behind rather than in front. Okay, so yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna say, I spoke about that, that hugging technique again uh, you've got to build up to this sort of situation and you'd be looking to cure rather than prevent 
because your horse obviously if a horse is coming up behind i'm pretty sure i think that's what you're talking about and or maybe if there's another horse in front they want to keep up um, they're obviously quite soft so they don't feel like you're hanging on to them but the anticipation of being held on to uh, in the past maybe or whatever means that they don't go into the bridle but they they've got all this energy and that want so it all comes up underneath you and i would say um you know you need to set up a scenario where you can practice that situation safely if possible so you know in, in an arena or in a, in a piece of field that you know well with a friend that you can sort of say okay come up behind me and i'm just going to try that thing and then come past me and then maybe repeat it a few times until you feel your horse go okay i don't need to worry about that and you can also if it feels like it's escalating too much you can control the situation by saying to your friend just go a little bit wider away or slow down or stop there and while i just you know get my horse back in the classroom type thing mm -hmm. so i would say first without anything get your horse to start sort of accepting your contact because a lot of horses that get hot like that you know and particularly the ones that won't go near the bridle and you know you're touching me with your leg and it all it all gets too much well if they can learn to accept that contact from you and just take it as like a it's all right instead of a oh i've got to try and keep away from it um and in your case bottling up you know they learn to settle to your contact all right Hope Super. That's um, yeah sorry go on I was just going to say it's it's something to try there's other things you can try and use patterns as well remember sort of if a horse is in a consistent or in a routine that can also be really helpful for learning yeah brilliant uh, fiona has asked could you just talk through the rope on the ground method again please what are you looking for with this technique all right so what i'm looking for is initially your horse won't be watching where they're walking so they'll end up walking up into your personal space. Um, so the idea of the rope on the ground is that they will tread over the rope or on the rope and check themselves. They'll feel a pressure or if they step over the rope, it'll wrap around their leg a little bit and I'll give it a pull, which pulls on their nose inadvertently. And when they give me a step back, so I'll keep bump, 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 and then I'll see them rock back and take a step back, I'll release. Now, if I repeat this enough times, I can be leading along. And if I feel my horse coming too close, instead of turning around, walking into my horse's space and pushing it backwards, and then walking off and my horse going, well, is that all? And careering after you again. Um, what I'll do is I'll just drop the rope. Now, what the horse does if they've done it a lot of times is they look at the rope and they instantly slow down because they, they've trod on the rope now or had the rope um, cue them to step backwards a few times. And they go, well, I don't want to tread on that because then I've got to go backwards. So they automatically slow themselves down without you having to handle your horse. It's just because your horse becomes responsible for what it's doing and you make it more aware of where it's going. And that inadvertently gives you space so your horse is no longer sort of breathing down your neck or trying to tank past you. Uh, Fiona's just asked, what is the bump, bump, bump? Um, how can I describe this? So, so imagine my, I'm gonna have to, I'm, I can, oh, I can, oh, I can already even see my leg. You have to excuse the office. <laughs> it's got a can you see my leg there now? Yeah, all good. Okay, so if my horse has stepped over the rope, yeah. I'm, out, I'm out in front over there. So one end is, is obviously hooked to the horse's head collar, which goes up to the horse's head collar there. The other is in my hand, and the one in my hand I'll go bump, bump, and every time I bump, bump my horse's leg like that, it put the pull goes round my horse's leg onto the nose. And my horse goes there, there, and then eventually the foot will come backwards. When it comes backwards, I release or even drop the rope. And I pick it up here, bring it back through, drop it on the ground again, and walk on. 
Yeah, very, very okay. nicely demoed there. <laughs> Bit of improv there. <laughs> yeah. I hope you can see where I was going with that. Um, yeah, it's a technique. There's lots of different ways to do it. The main thing is, you know, you might just turn around and apply a constant pressure, but don't be that person that turns around, puts pressure on your horse and says, go backwards and then start shaking about and the horse just stops and you go, oh, that'll do, and then walk on. Because then your horse just falls forward again. You haven't actually corrected their balance, which is falling all over, over the top of you. And sometimes, particularly at a constant pressure, you need to wait until they decide, um, okay, forward, no, well, maybe backwards. And like I say, it can take sometimes a little, horses go to sleep. I've done it where horses put some pressure here, <laughs> And I'm looking at them. I feel like I want to put more pressure on to make them do it, but I just stay constant. They go to sleep and then eventually they go, well, I'm awake now and uh, I'm still got this thing here. So what about backwards? Yes. Ooh. Boom. The light bulb goes off. So there. Brilliant. it's really important about your, you know, getting that result. Yeah. And what length of rope are you generally <laughs> using, Jason? So I've got the ropes that I use are about 12 foot long. Yeah. So, yeah. A bit longer than the, the average. Okay. And then Pandora says, I've only had my horse for two weeks. Oh, congratulations. New, nice. That new horse smell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's, um, he is fine having a head collar on, but when I tried to put his bridle on, he started raising his head up really high and I struggled to reach him. Do you have any tips to resolve this? Ooh. Yes, I'll, I'll give you a couple of things you can try. Um, so if you've got a head collar, if you just say you've got the head collar, geez, Woody would have been handy tonight, wouldn't he? <laughs> um, you've got a head collar here, just pull down on the head collar and your horse will come against it. And again, you just wait. And then you'll see your horse at some point do this, drop their head, release the pressure and just teach them when they've, to just lower their head. <coughs> and you can teach that off the head collar. You can teach it off putting your hand on top and doing the same thing, applying the pressure there. Wait, wait, head lowers, you know, take the pressure away, give them a rub and just teach them to lower the head. And I would do that before and after I bridle. Mm -hmm. So that's a good one. If you get into a position where, you know, you do it before, you go to put the bridle on, they put the head up, you manage to get it on and then you put the head down, but that scenario keeps going on. Then something I like to use is a bit of reverse psychology. So think about this. If I was to get, if, you, if I was to put my head up and then someone held my head up, so I might, someone put their hand under my chin and held me there. After a couple of minutes, what am I really gonna wanna do? Yeah, put your head down. Put yeah. your head down. So <clears throat> for those of you that can't get up high enough on your horse, then holding your horse's head up just under the chin. And sometimes I just hover my hand underneath for those really big horses. I just hold underneath for a little bit until they sort of get, and I just keep, and then you'll see them lower the head and I just take it away. And pretty soon when you go to them with your hand, they want to bring the head down, not take it up. Yeah. Um, and last, lastly, bend. So if I get a horse that puts the head up, I might, I might hook part of the bridle over their nose like this and just pull them around to the side. If a horse is bent, they don't put their head up as nearly as high. Yeah, really good. <coughs> Excuse me. Really good. Oh, just see if there's any any more questions. Um, I think we are out of questions now. You've obviously given so many tips. You've given people lots to think about tonight. In particular, how flexible you are at jumping up and uh, demonstrating <laughs> techniques. <Yeah. laughs> you get all sorts of me. You never know what you're going to get. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if there's no more questions, then we will um, just move on to let you know what's happening next. And then for those of you that aren't already your horsemanship members will tell you how to get in touch with, with Jason. So, oh, do you, yeah, I'll just share. Oh, yeah, have you got that last, 
Yeah, got that last I'm slide. Put that on. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that'd be brilliant. Sorry, I, so, could people see me? Or they, was I just talking to the? Oh yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. Everyone could see you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The next slide um, after that one would be great. Brilliant. So, if you've enjoyed tonight and you'd like to try out some more of the Horse Tribe webinars, and I know we've got some regulars on tonight who've, who've been to most of them. We've got coming up in March, can't quite believe it's March next month, but it is. We have Ali Wakelin. Um, she is a coach and horse trainer, and she's talking about starting and developing groundwork. So Jason's given some fabulous tips today about groundwork. So Ali's going to talk a bit more about that on the 3rd of March. Uh, then we've got Simon Kokosa. He's back for the third time. He's This time we're doing a full Q&A session because we have so many questions at the end of his last uh, webinar about kissing spines that we're putting on a Q&A session specifically to answer questions about conditioning and kissing spine rehab with horses. Then we've got Donna Case who's an independent nutritionist so she's not tied to any of the feed companies. She can talk with um, Brett about top tips for spring feeding. Uh, interesting change of season quite often with horse behaviour. And then finally we've got Hayley Marsh who's a veterinary physiotherapist and she's talking about um, something or oh, a topic we touched on tonight, prevention rather than cure. So um, practice and prevention. So prevention rather than cure with your horse. So we've coined the, the phrase with her prehab, not rehab. It would be great to, to do things with, with your horse to keep it in top condition. Um, not only call out the phys veterinary physio when um, there's an issue. So uh, join us for those, have a look on the website. And then there's a slide with, uh, getting in touch with Jason. So if you're not already a Your Horsemanship member, maybe you'd like to be one. Jason, would you like to share anything on this page? Uh, so uh, a couple of those videos that you guys will have seen this evening, they're on the Your Horsemanship website and there is, I think about another 200 or so other videos on there. They're, they're in an order. So I, I start horses and I've started from the very beginning and worked right through to where you get a safe, sensible riding horse. And there's, I do webinars each month as well, of which some of my members will be on tonight. And um, I also do demonstrations, they're virtual now. And sometimes I do live, live demonstrations here. But there's lots of things to learn and good groups to, to, um, to get involved with. And um, yeah, that's your horsemanship. Fabulous. Actually, we've got one, I feel mean not ans uh, asking this question because Emma's come in with her last question. So let's let's make Emma smile with an answer. So Emma says, sorry, late question. If leading my horse and I stop, but he carries on walking out to the side, how do I stop that and get him to stop behind me? So do you remember the that really short video? where I was moving my horse to the left and to the right, and I was engaging my core and really, you know, projecting my energy. So that is exactly what I do. So have a look at that video. And if they walk too far off to the, to the side of me, I'll stop, grab, gauge my core and get a step back in behind me and walk on. And you can imagine what your horse is gonna to start to think if you're consistent with that. If I walk too far this side, the hand comes round, picks up the head collar. I can feel the strength back behind. I feel a release. Pretty soon your horse is going to start to walk up the side and think, actually, well, they're going to see your hand coming and go, I know what that means. It means dropping behind me. But it does take a, a bit of work to do, but it will definitely, it's something I like to do. Yeah, fabulous. Thank you very, very much for tonight. You, I think you've given all of us a lot to think about and think about practicing. And Charlotte uh, has put in, in the Q&A, huge thank you. That was really interesting and thought provoking. Um, and Rachel's coming through as well. Thank you, that's been really helpful. I'll be brave now and I'll keep my leg on um, during <laughs> my horse's bouncy moments. Oh yes, uh, fantastic. But, but, uh, but when you're doing that, make sure you start, start from a walk. Don't sort of get your horse, you know, they're cantering along and they're all hot and then you think, right, I've got to do that thing. 
<laughs> yeah. Stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So start with your sort of semi control first and get the feel of it first. And then, you know, you watch how it really does help. Yeah, wonderful. And if any of you would like to see Jason in the flesh rather than from the waist up, well, mind you, we did see your legs tonight as well, <laughs> rather than from the waist up. We, we got a full, yeah, the full body tonight. <laughs> um, remember that you can come to Horse Fest, which is our annual summer festival, which starts this year, this July at Kelso Hill in Cheshire, 8th to the 10th of July. And Jason will be there dancing around the fire pit. So, I'm um, really looking forward to it. Yeah, and because you guys are now a member of the Horse Tribe, you get um, the best prices. So check that out on the website, and we hope to see you there. So thank you very much, Jason. Have a, a great rest of the evening, and um, I hope the Wi-Fi is back up in the main house soon. Well, hopefully. All right, guys, <laughs> thank you. For the, uh, thanks, to everyone, for joining us, and hope to see you soon. Yeah, take care. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.